Hey, welcome to Flight Test. I'm Josh. Today we're going to be showing you how to build the FT Twin Sparrow. Now, if you haven't seen the release video of the FT Twin Sparrow, it's basically a rework on a classic flight test design where we actually installed two tractor version motors instead of one pusher. Now everything's still the same with the Sparrow though. You can still build it with one sheet of foam. You can build it as a chuck glider, a two channel a pusher, or even now a twin engine. And the best part is it has a removable nose so you can put FPV gear in and also your battery. As always, we have free plans to download or you can choose to support us by going to our store and picking up a speed build kit and cutting your build time in half. Let's go ahead and get our materials in order and we'll get started. You're gonna also notice as our Power Pack H evolves that you may see a different distribution board or may see different style props. Because this pack is kind of early generation and also with prop technology changing so much, you may notice a different color or style of prop. This is a very simple and basic power distribution board. What a power distribution board does is it takes battery voltage and turns it into clean voltage like for 12 volt and 5 volt applications. What we're gonna be doing is soldering our ESCs but also soldering pads to our 5 volt and our 12 volt and maybe even we'll put something extra on like a camera mount so we can power up our VTX and a camera for FPV. So because we have to do some basic soldering here, we're gonna go ahead and get all that out of the way first. I'm gonna go ahead and first lay this out the way we wanna solder it up, and then we'll go ahead and go back piece by piece and solder it together. First thing we're gonna have is since it's a twin motor, I'm gonna go ahead and face both my ESCs going outwards. I'm gonna place my motors on each end. This is then gonna to connect to our power distribution board in the middle. And we're also going to take this servo lead, we're going to cut it in half, and we're going to make one end supply voltage to our receiver, since that's not done through our ESCs. We're going to go ahead and save this other end here, because you could use it for future applications like powering lights, or even a camera in a VTX. This is our main battery lead. If you're going to be powering this off of a 4-cell, I'd strongly suggest that you use an XT30 connector, rather than a JST, because of the voltage it's going to pull. But in this case, we're going to be flying this off of a 2 or 3 cell 450 milliamp Hyperion battery. So we're going to go ahead and solder that on as well. We'll place that right there. The other thing that we're going to want to make sure that we do is that we're going to be putting heat shrink over our wires before we solder together. For soldering up our motors, we're going to want to make sure that we have one motor spinning clockwise and the other motor spinning counterclockwise. It's really important when we do this that all we need to do is simply take the wire straight from the ESC and straight from the motor and solder them just as they appear. On the other motor, we're going to pick any two leads that we see on either the ESC or the motor and we're going to reverse them. This is going to make the motor spin in the opposite direction. And the other way, all we need to do is take one lead and switch over. So first thing we're going to do in getting this soldered is we're going to go ahead and cut our tubing that we need. And once again, as our power packs change, you may notice the tubing diameter or the color may change a little bit. But we're going to cut each side into three individual parts, keeping them equal. I always like to do this first because if we wait for it and we solder it up, we have to desolder it. That just makes things messy. Now, if you have a set of helping hands, you can always use that. I prefer to work really close to the table. Always works good for me. This is going straight out. I'm going to go ahead and straighten my leads up nice and even. And we do have a really great video teaching you how to solder, so don't be intimidated by this. I just strongly recommend that you go to that video and watch it first. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pretend. I'm not going to go in great detail about soldering because, like I said, if you're new to soldering, you can watch that video. It'll take you through all the steps that you need. Tinning is a very simple process where we get it nice and wet which is a little bit of solder and put it on. Now I'm just going to take one lead at a time, touch them together, there's one, just take something a little heavier here so I can manipulate this a little easier. two. There's three. Never let's take anything for granted. I like to give it a nice tug on each line before moving on. Now I can slide this over and once I get everything soldered up I'll take my heat gun and I'll shrink it all up. Let's go ahead and do the other side while we're at it. 
once again roughly three equal parts on our tubing you're going to be slide, you're going to be supplied with enough tubing to do six individual solder joints or even more if you make it smaller I'm just gonna go ahead and take my nail and open this up just a little bit more, give myself a little bit more surface. You're gonna see some motors have a little bit more of a lead than others. I wanna basically match the diameter or the length of what I'm soldering to. Now for this motor specifically, since I did the other one straight off the motor, I'm gonna go ahead and pick two and I'm gonna cross them, like you see here. Now you don't have to hold all of them in one place, just know in this case the center wire is gonna to go to the furthest out wire that you see here, and we're gonna solder it accordingly. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and tin our wires. Oftentimes people really avoid soldering, but it is a skill that once you learn, you're gonna find it so useful. It's gonna enable you to do lots of repairs, do more advanced things, and also dream a little bit and have a little bit of fun with your model. Let's get a little drop is all we need. It doesn't hurt to have a little fan blowing keeping that solder smoke away from you. Don't want to breathe that in. Oops, a little bit too much there. I always like working on the ground here. I'm just gonna use my solder roll, kind of pull this one up. And I'm gonna take my middle wire in this case, take it all the way to the outside. I'm just gonna to touch it to it. Give it about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, little tug, we're good to go. I'm going to take that far out wire now. There we go. One final one. Now it's very easy to see that our outer wire of the motor is going to our center wire and vice versa. The center wire of the motor is going to the outer wire of the ESC. At any point you don't feel good about a solder joint, make sure you redo it. You don't want to take this for granted because this is going to be sealed inside of the wing. Before we solder this onto the power distribution board, we're going to go ahead and slide this little sleeve that's included with our ESCs right over the ESC, and this is going to give a future protection from moisture and potential crashes. Slide these over once again. We're going to do a simple check and, and power everything up before we go ahead and move on so we don't need to worry too much. Our motors are now done. We're going to go ahead and put it on our power distribution board. So let's come ahead and try to kind of make sense of this all, lay it out nice and clean. Everyone has a different style of soldering. Don't want to say that there's not one that's more correct than others, but you know, just do what works for you. You're going to notice when you get really close to this power distribution board, you're going to see negative and positive stationed all the way. Because this originally was meant for a multi-rotor, you're going to have way more pads than you need, especially for source voltage from your battery. Don't worry about that, that's just fine. What we're going to do is, because of this motor, it's going to have the switch placed and back towards the trailing edge of the airplane. So I'm going to go ahead and lay this down like you see here. And you're going to notice that our black wire lines up with this front center pad. We're going to go ahead and pre tin our pads right now. Try to avoid overheating your pads. Don't work too hot of a temperature. Just keep the little exposed wire about the same size as your pad. You don't want exposed wire going anywhere other than over the pad because what that'll cause is a potential short in the future. So I'm going to use a table as my friend. Just tin bolt these leads right here. Keep in mind if you're new to soldering, the solder stays hot for a lot longer than you'd imagine. So don't take it for granted and grab the end. All right, no need for heat shrink tubing on this. We're just gonna go straight over the pad. I'm just gonna go ahead and solder that in. Give me, I have very shaky hands, but if I can do it, you can too. Here's one.
Don't need to be a surgeon with super smooth, steady hands to be able to solder really well. Now before we go back to this, we're going to go ahead and do a continuity check to make sure nothing's shorted out. Let's go ahead and do our other side now. There'll be no switching on the other side for positive and negative. is always going to be positive and negative. To open this up just a little bit more. Bring our solder over. It's a really a rewarding process getting this out of the way first because it makes the whole build so much more enjoyable. Plus you're going to find yourself having to stop your build, clean off your table, and kind of regrouping to do this step anyway. So get it out of the way now and you're going to find that you're going to enjoy this whole process a lot more. All right. Positive and negative. All 10. Like I said, just make sure that you don't have a connection between the two. As we said before, positive to positive. Just press that right down in there. Negative and negative. A lot of times people just kind of avoid doing a certain model or a certain project because they think that they're not going to be able to get it perfect. There is no rule that you have to have anything in model aviation, whether it's drones or fixed wing perfect. You just got to be willing to redo it. So we got everything all done here. Our next step is we're going to go ahead and put our power supply on. Now we have male and female. A lot of times people wonder what male and female is. It could be considering the outside of the case or the pin, but in this case, we're going to take a look at the pins. If the pins have a probe to it, that's going to be a male. And if it actually receives the probe, that's going to be a female. So oftentimes when you're ordering connectors, keep that in mind, but always look at the picture because sometimes, especially when you order different connectors from different companies, they may use different terminology. In this case, this is going to be the battery that we're going to be using. It's our Hyperion 453 cell. We're also going to be flying off a two cell as well too. We don't want to plug this in, but what we do want to confirm is that this is the receiving end to the battery, and it is. It doesn't really matter which end you pick. I'm just going to go ahead and carefully kind of strip back and retin our connectors. Try to avoid using the solder that they originally have. Sometimes I'll even cut that solder off and, uh, and put my own on. Nice and shiny. If it's dull, we have a problem. All right, I'm going to kind of go away from the existing pads just to give myself a little bit more room. And I'm also going to solder this away from the switch that we have here. There's really no rules. You can put this source pad on any of the pads that you see here. But I like to give myself a little extra room to work. So we're just going to solder on one pad here. Not too much, not too little. Kind of give myself a five second rule here. If I find myself sitting on a pad more than five seconds, most likely I'm starting to overheat that pad. That's just not a rule of thumb. It's just kind of my personal opinion. I kind of try to keep myself in check. If I'm struggling with a solder joint, I'll back off after about three to five seconds. And that keeps me from overheating the pads. Right, let's go ahead and put our power connector on here. Once again, we've confirmed that this is the end that plugs into the battery. I'm gonna go right over my positive. One down. Give it about 10 seconds. Want a nice shiny connection. And then our second one. Press that right down in place. If you have a dull connection, that's most likely a sign of a cold solder joint, which means you put an extreme amount of heat on one piece, but not the other. Again, we're gonna go back. We're gonna confirm our positive and negative connections. We're going to have a nice healthy tug. Imagine this crashing into a wall like we do so many times at a very high speed. We want all this to be as strong as possible. You can see that we're almost done with this. We've almost soldered up the whole entire assembly that we need to be able to put in the airplane and it's only been a few minutes. This goes really easy if you just take the time and do it right. Now you're going to see a couple connectors here. You're going to see a JST connector and you're also going to see an extension. 
We give you that extra extension because we want you to be able to cut this to the length you see fit. Because these are called opto ESCs, which means they don't have an internal battery eliminating circuit, and what that does is actually powers the receiver, we need to give the receiver power on our own. Now rather than having a unique little special connector here, we went ahead and included a whole 20 centimeter because this other end can be used on this board to power things like cameras, VTXs, lights, any accessory you want, basically off of any of the voltages you want. Now, the receiver does not take a 12 volt voltage. If you solder it into 12 volt and plug it in, you're gonna destroy not only your receiver, but potentially your servos as well too. We wanna make sure we solder this into the tab that says five volt. So let's go ahead and give ourselves plenty of room. And I'm just gonna cut this perfectly in half. One thing we don't need on this is our signal wire. Our signal wire is gonna be the yellow or orangish yellow wire. Oftentimes, it's indicated by a white wire as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and peel this off, and rather than cutting it and leaving it in here, I can simply just lift up on this little tab and pull the whole piece out. You can even save this for later because you never know where these leads will come in handy. We now have a connector that's perfect for powering our receiver. This is a switchable five volt on this side, but I wanna save this for our camera and VTX for later. So if I ever wanna fly without FPV or there's other people flying FPV, I can turn this around and fly line of sight if I want to. So I'm gonna concentrate on the other end over here. You're gonna see a 12 volt and a five volt. Now obviously if you're flying two cell, you're not gonna get a proper 12 volt source there. So that won't work. It's only gonna work with three cell. But in this case, five volts where we wanna be. Exposing my leads, I gotta retint this. And I'm gonna go to the five volt pad. I always check before, check during, and check after to make sure my positive and negative is proper. It's so easy to get in a hurry and have one wrong connection and ruin a lot of electronics. So don't be in too much of a hurry. Let's go ahead and get these tight. You oftentimes will see people twist in the leads, and that's for a very good reason. If there's air in between the, uh, the pieces of uh, wiring, that actually creates a little insulated pocket and will give you a very poor solder joint. So twist those leads up nice and shiny. And you're going to find that the solder flows right into it. All right. I'm going to match my positive and positive. I need a little weight on this so it doesn't wander. Kind of bend it so it fits nice. One wire at a time. There's one. This is where a little pair of tweezers is really handy. Just make sure they have the rubber coating so it doesn't travel the heat all the way up and burn you. There's two. Now our last step is gonna to be to put this JST on here. For this model specifically, I'm gonna be setting this up for FPV. Now this isn't something that you have to set up right away, but if you solder it on now, it's gonna make it easier for the future. Oftentimes if I'm using like a small FXT805 or our new FPV uh, video transmitter micro set, um, this won't be the connector we want to use. But in this case I want to use the new mini split. That's going to take a JST connector. I don't need a tremendous amount of length here, so I'm going to go ahead and just cut this in half. If you're gonna be using accessories that have an excessively high amperage draw, like maybe an FPV unit or a split, you may wanna avoid going to the accessory that can switch on and off and take it straight to battery voltage. Just confirm that the accessory that you're powering can take the cells that you're supplying. All right, same drill as before. We're gonna look at the positive and negatives. We're gonna tin those little wires here. We could pass those through, but I'm just gonna lay them on top. There's one. More heat on your soldering iron does not mean a stronger connection. Usually it just means there's damaged pads. So be very careful not to have too hot of a setting. We discuss all that in our uh, soldering video. There we go, ends are tinted. A little bigger, I'm just gonna trim a little bit shorter so you don't need all that length. There's one, there's two. All right, once again, we're going to go back. We're going to look very carefully. We have our positive and our negative. Just going to touch down right over there. A little weight 
here. Once again, I have very shaky hands, so if I can do it, you can too. So look in the course of about 10 minutes what's been created. This is pretty cool. We got our battery going in, powering the power distribution board. We have that power going out, powering our two motors, one spin in one direction, one spin in the other. We have our power going to our receiver that will give it voltage to be able to receive signals. And then we have an accessory power cable. Let's go ahead and plug this into a servo tester and make sure everything spins up the proper direction. All right, so now that we're ready to test our motors, one thing we absolutely do not want to have happen is any of these leads touch each other. So I'm going to make sure that the solder is over each lead, as you see here. Once we power these up, if the leads touch, it'll smoke your ESC. A very simple way to make sure that nothing shorts out is I'm going to go ahead and pull my tape in here. I'm going to go ahead and make sure all these leads are done. I'm just going to go ahead and tape it down half on the insulation, half on the wire, and half on the table. Do that on both sides. So we have our insulation cover and our exposed wires. Everything looks good. Nothing's touching each other. Now before we put power to this circuit, we're going to make sure that nothing is shorted. The easiest way to do that is by using this volt ohm meter here. You can see I turned it already to uh, for continuity. And I believe this either means over limits or open loop, something like that. But basically what we want to see is when we touch down the positive and negative, that it stays OL. So when I touch down this and you can go to any positive and negative pad, So if at any point that you see that you have something that's like a continuity, so I'm going to go kind of wander over both pads here, and you see that you have continuity, what that means is two things. Either you have your solder touching two different pads, shortening out, or you have your positive and negative reversed. In this case, we're ready to move forward. So our first step is we need to power our servo tester. So we're going to go ahead and plug that in here. We have our ground and our hot. Next, we're going to go ahead and put our two in here. We're going to go ground on the same side. Next lead in. And the next lead in. This is going to make our servo tester basically act as a receiver, so we'll be able to wind up the motors, make sure they're spinning the right way. Now we're going to go and take our battery. We're going to apply voltage. So the setup that we have here is we're powering our servo tester through this 5-volt source. You don't want to put anything over 5 volts through a servo tester. And we have both of our leads plugged in. So now if I hold this down, what we should be able to see when I power this up, this one's spinning this way and this one's spinning this way. So we need to reverse one of these leads. So 90% of the time, whenever you swap one lead, it'll work. Some cases, it simply isn't the case. So that's why we want to go ahead and check this before we put it together. All I'm going to do is swap one of these leads back and we'll be in good shape. All right, let's go ahead and I swap two of the leads. Let's go and make sure that both are going the right direction. This one's going this way, and this one's going this way. Through this process, we also know that our 5-volt source is working, so our receiver is going to get proper voltage. We're now ready to move on to our next step before building our airframe, and that's shrinking down all of our tubing nice and tight. All right, so our, everything is shrunken down. You can use a match, you can use a heat gun, you can use a professional little shrinker. Uh, anything you see fit, just make sure you don't overheat the components, especially if you're using a lighter. Uh, we're ready to move on to our next step. Everything has been tested, and that is getting our servo centered. For our servos, you may notice that we have flight test branded boxes. These are still the Emax 9051 servos. We love those servos, and we're going to continue using them. But we went ahead and inspect them out just to make them easier to identify with what power packs they come with. So for our Twin Sparrow, we're going to select this servo arm that you see here. We're only going to need one side, so we're going to remove this with a razor blade. Once we center the servos, we're simply going to mount the servo where the servo arms are opposing each other. Cool. Just put this on. With our servos, the orientation that we're going to mount is going to be opposing each other like you see here. Before we screw these down, we're going to use our servo centering tool and center our servos. Making sure the ground is on the bottom. In this case, it's brown wire. And we're going to center up both these servos at once. You do not want to put 8.4 volts through this, but what we can do is we can put 3.7 in. The way we'll do that is by going to this bottom wire that you see here, 
and this is isolating just one cell because we're leaving one cell out of it. So this wire here is not connected to anything. We have 3.7 volts going between these two pins. Whatever you do, make sure you never put above 5.5 volts to your system. If you plug a two cell battery in it, you're not only gonna destroy the servo tester, but all the servos connected. So you're gonna see there's three different modes on this servo tester. There's one that actually lets you adjust it, like what we were doing for our ESC. The center switch automatically centers it, and the lower switch where it says automatic cycles it. And you can increase that cycle by where you put your potentiometer. In this case, we want the center one where it's flashing. All right, now that our servos are all centered up, I'm just gonna go ahead and take our screwdriver and screw this down. Now, if any time that you're actually screwing the servo in and it moves, don't worry, because we can always recenter the servos before final install. You don't want to neglect this step because if you lose your servo arm, you're going to lose control of the control surface that you're moving. Our servos are now centered. We're ready to move on to the next step. We have our power pack all soldered up and ready to go into the airplane. The only difference I'm going to point out is because we're going to be flying this with an FPV micro split, I went ahead and soldered the accessory cable to actual battery voltage because it can take between two and four cells. The amp draw is going to be too high if I leave it on the five volt and I don't want it to brown out. One thing I also want to point out here is we're going to be updating our power packs. Anytime that we refer to an A or a B or any size power pack for any of our models, it may be different because as the technology improves, we're also going to be updating and improving our technology. These are currently Emacs 1106s, but look in the very near future to actually have flight test branded motors with better bearings, higher power, and higher efficiency. Our power assembly is now done. We're ready to move on to building the Twin Sparrow wings. So for our airframe, we're going to go ahead and start with the biggest piece of the airplane, and that's going to be the wings. The nice thing about this is once you're done with the wings, it's really going to go very smooth and very fast from that point on. What you're going to see in these sheets here is you're going to see your wing assembly, your tail feathers, you're even going to see the motor mount from the original Sparrow kit. So if you want to do a single engine conversion, you can go back to the older video and watch that. Along with that, you're going to see some gauges, tail skid, your fuselage is going to be on this plank, our nose assembly, and also the plywood pieces that we need for our power pods, our control horns, even Velcro and push rods will be included with the speed build kit. Now if you're scratch building, the black will be cut through, the red lines will be score cut, and the blue lines will be indicator. Big thank you to Dan Sponholz for making these plans so easy to understand. You're going to notice that the wing has a lot less pieces of the original Sparrow. It's actually the same exact number, but what we've done now is we are using cavities that we open up to be able to fold the wing together rather than placing pieces that could possibly go on crooked. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our razor blade and we're going to do a light score cut, making sure we don't go down through the paper. Now a really easy trick is to doll the very tip of your razor blade on a piece of concrete or sandpaper. That's going to make it so as you pull through that you're not going to cut down through the paper below. But before you do this, make sure you test on the scrap piece. We're simply going to go here. Once again, if you cut through the bottom layer of paper, it's not the end of the world. Just repair it with a piece of tape. We're going to open up these cavities. I like to open up 90 degrees. And we're simply going to roll this out. There we go. While we're here, we can go ahead and pop our little accessory port out. This is where the power distribution board's gonna go. And we can even get rid of some of this flashing right here. There we are. Our next step is to go ahead and cut a double bevel. And we're gonna cut this right at the leading edge line where the wing is gonna fold over. To do this, I'm gonna fold this at a 180 degree angle. I'm gonna go ahead and hold this here just to kind of show you. I'm not gonna hold the blade at a 90 degree angle here because it's gonna be very easy for the blade to wander around. I'm gonna hold it at an acute angle so the blade guides through the foam. Now you're gonna notice there that the paper is right in the middle. I wanna avoid cutting through that paper so it doesn't cause the edge to open up. So I'm gonna simply guide this through here I'm going to go nice and slow, and you can see that I don't have to really worry about getting it just perfect. This is all going to be on the inside of the wing, and all we're doing is telling the wing where we want it to bend. 
Now, if you're working with younger ones or you're working in a school or you don't want someone handling a razor blade, we have a really great video below that's how to build, tech or build techniques without using a razor blade. Feel free to check that out. There we go. This double bevel is a very common technique with all of our planes. And when you're done, you should be able to move this up to at least a 90 degree angle without feeling any resistance. So let's go ahead and recap here. We've removed the cavities on both these sides here. We've done our double bevel and we're ready to move on to the next step. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this 180 degrees. And with my hot glue gun here, I'm using the AdTech Pro 200. It never runs out of glue, but you don't need to use one this big for these smaller models. I'm simply gonna do one fold of glue. I'm gonna fold it over 180 degrees. And I'm gonna press down firmly for about 45 seconds or just enough time for a dad joke. What is a fish with no eyes? A fifth. All right, so we have our next glue joint done. We're gonna go ahead and put one more layer on as well. Now, if you're scratch building, always make sure that you fold and test these pieces first. Why is a bear hairy? For protection. So we're now done with the main spar of our wing. The main spar is actually gonna be what gives us the strength. And if you notice here, right in the center, this is where our score cut is. This score cut is gonna give us the ability to give us dihedral. Dihedral gives the plane inherent stability. So when you take your hands off the stick, it'll naturally slowly try to level itself out. So our next step here is we're gonna go ahead and give the airfoil its shape. To do this, we're simply gonna just roll this in and let the score cuts kind of collapse on themselves. Make sure you don't open this up with a pen tip or anything because we want this to kind of be as tight as possible. We're gonna roll this over and this very top piece should be parallel to the bottom plate of the wing. Once we're happy with that shape, we're gonna take our hot glue gun and we can do one row at a time if we want here. We're simply gonna press a thin ribbon of glue into each seam. Now, if you built a lot, you can do a couple seams at a time. The biggest thing we don't want to do is we don't want to glue this down together. So we just kind of want to pat it where it needs to be, but not let it glue to the spar. Okay, I'm going to hold it down in the place. This is going to make our wing so much stronger. Just about 20 seconds or so. Last one. Now with our kits and if you're scratch building, you have plenty of scrap material. So if anything ever makes you nervous, you can simply practice that on a scrap piece of foam before taking it to your airframe. And one thing we strongly recommend, anytime you build a speed build kit, trace out your pieces on an extra piece of foam. If you crash something and break a wing, you have a spare ready. But if you have success, you have a plane you can build with a friend. So this is one of the great benefits of soldering up everything up ahead of time because now we get to go ahead and install our power system. For this, we're going to simply go ahead and I'm going to mount this so the motors are spinning outward. If you get it backwards, it's not a big deal. And I'm going to press each motor right through the motor hole like you see here. I'm going to pull these down through a little bit longer than they need to be and center up the power distribution board in the middle here. No need to glue this down quite yet. I'm just getting everything out of the way so it's nice and clean. You're going to see that I'm just making sure that the wires aren't touching where the spars are where the glue is going to go. We can reach through and grab all these wires and pull them out when the time is right. All right, so one last little test fit here. We're going to go ahead and press this down. We're going to make sure that when we roll this down, that there's no wires in the way and that the trailing edge of the wing goes flat up against the table just like you see here. Once we're happy with that, we're going to focus our glue right on the leading edge here and on our main spars. Just one simple stripe right on the back. Get that little guy out of there. All right, and we're going to hold it down. So where does Fonzie like to go to lunch? Chick-fil-A.
All right, so this is one step you definitely don't want to rush. If you lift up your hands and you notice the wing is unfolding, that means the glue isn't dry. Hold it down a little longer, think of another dad joke. So at this point, we're going to use our dihedral gauge, and we're going to go right into the center part of the spar right here. And this is going to give us the proper dihedral that we need for our plane. Once again, dihedral makes the plane not only fly more stable, but also helps it to coordinate its turns. So I went ahead and went to my kit. I just ripped off a little scrap piece of foam. And I'm now going to go ahead, and I'm going to be very careful not to pump so much glue that it goes down on the lower level. Just enough to glue the top surface together. There we go. I'm going to lift this up. I'm going to take my little squeegee and I'm going to squeegee it down. Now, obviously, hot glue is hot. We don't want you guys burning your hands. So try to avoid touching this with your fingers. So did you hear about the cheese factory that exploded in France? There is nothing left but debris. All right, if at any point that this seems like it's not strong enough, you can always put another layer of hot glue down. Once you're happy with it, I like to go ahead and reinforce with a piece of tape. I'm just gonna hold that down. And just fold it under each side. All right, for this next step, before we build the nacelles, we're gonna go ahead and get our power distribution board and all the wires that we need to have pulled out in order here. We should see our accessory port if we're gonna need it. We should see our two signal wires from our ESC, and we should see the power wire for our receiver. Once we're happy with that, I'm just gonna tuck this down in, and eventually we're gonna go back and glue that in place. All right, in preparing the wing for the next step, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the two motors in just through these two notches here. And I'm gonna set the wing aside while we build our engine in this house. So one thing that we got some really great feedback from the original Micro Twin design, which was the FT Dart, was that the nacelles are just a little on the weak side. I'm actually going to be going back and kind of retrofitting it with this design, but these nacelles are all plywood and they take a tremendous beating and notch even easier than the originals. So I'm going to go ahead and pop these out. If anyone's scratch building and they don't want to have to jigsaw these, we're also going to have short kits available where you can get the parts that you need so you can just pop it together. We don't want anything holding you guys back from building your own model plane. All right, so let's go ahead and do a dry fit. If you have any little pieces here, you can sand them off or cut them off. We're first gonna go ahead and set our little piece down in the bottom. And then you're gonna notice that these tabs are a little bit on the taller side. That's because that's what notches into the wings. So these will just press into place on both sides. Just like you see here. Whenever you're doing plywood pieces, you always wanna dry fit before you glue. And speaking of glue, we're not going to be using hot glue for this. We're going to be using instant glue. I like using the M300M for mercury adhesives, and this is an accelerator. You don't necessarily need this, but it takes a dry time down from maybe a minute or two to about 15 seconds. Now that we have these nice tight joints, I'm just going to go ahead and put a little drop on the corner. I'm going to let gravity kind of help me as I trace the inside here. More glue does not mean more strength. We just want to put it just enough to kind of get in the seam. And what I like to do is kind of wiggle and move around, just making sure that I'm kind of pulsating all the pieces so the glue is sucking into the seams the best as possible. Once we're happy with that and everything is nice and firm, I'm just going to take some accelerator and spray it in. Notice I'm just going around the whole side, just making sure everything is tight. The tighter that you make these joints, the stronger that this is going to be. All right, let's go ahead and do the second piece. The tables are fun. I'm just going to rock it down so we don't fatigue anything. Just roll this right up into place. Notch it on one side. Roll this right up into place. Notch it in on the other side. There we go. A little glue down in the corners. I'm not just using the glue as a gusset. By kind of pulsating it and moving the pieces back and forth, I'm actually letting the glue just wick down inside and go to where it needs to go. On a bigger joint, I'd put it on the end of the joint and then press it into place. 
Uh, these are so small, we don't need to do that. There we go. Just gonna check this out while it dries. Got about 15 seconds of adjustments before everything is rock solid. About a minute later, we have two nacelles ready to go onto our wing. Our next step is we're gonna simply do a dry fit here. You're gonna notice that these tabs will line up perfectly. Now this is gonna give us the proper spacing from the fuselage. It's also gonna give us the thrust angle that we need. Everything's gonna work out really good. Just press it in both spots. Make sure it goes nice and flat right down to the bottom. Now the nice thing about the way this is spaced is you're gonna notice that the wires that we soldered are actually gonna still be exposed. We want that because if we ever have to do a motor repair or we're, you know, got our orientation wrong or our rotation wrong, we can still fix that. We're happy with the fit. Our next step is going to be to screw on our motors. Now we're going to screw on our motors so that the wire is actually going to go over the top here and then we can use a little zip tie or a little drop of glue and dress our wires later. Let's go ahead and get our motor mounting screws. So you're going to notice with this power pack that we have three different sizes of motor mount screws. That's because this is mainly a quad motor and you have different types of frames that you're going to mount to. The silver screws we're going to put aside because those are for our props. And we're going to pick the medium screws right here. We're going to go ahead and put the long screws and the short screws aside because who knows, we may need those someday. Now in with our power pack kit, you're going to notice that we give you a free screwdriver. This is a 1.5 millimeter screwdriver. Make sure you hang on to this because it's a wonderful tool for use in the future. Simply going to take this and pass the screw right on through and I'm going to pick the highest corner. You're going to notice I'm letting the wires favor towards the middle. And I'm not tightening this down all the way. I'm just getting it just a couple threads in because I want the motor to be able to wiggle so I can get the other three screws in. So now that we have all four of our screws started, we can go ahead and tighten them down together. No need to over tighten them, just make them nice and snug. If you're worried about these coming loose, you can even put a little drop of... Uh, Loctite on there. Sometimes I just prefer to put a little drop of hot glue over top of them. All right, so we have one down. I'll just go ahead and press this in place just so it doesn't wiggle around on me. Let's go ahead and mount our second one. Only difference on this one is we're going to disfavor that wire just towards the inside of the wing. There we go. All right, so when you're all done, you're going to see your screws all nice and neat. Everything's going to be tight. We're ready to glue on our nacelles. So for our final fitting, we want to really make sure that our nacelles are nice and tight against the wing. When we put this down, we should see no gap between the wing and the plywood on both sides. Once we're happy with that, we can flip this over. I'm just going to put a nice bead of glue on the foam because the glue is not going to dry as quickly when it's on the foam as compared to the uh, to wood. I'm going to press it down one final time. Just enough time for a dad joke. Why is no one friends with Dracula? Because he's a real pain in the neck. All right, same process on the other side. Test the fit, bead of glue. Right down through those notches. And hold it till it dries. So one last little glue joint I'm going to go ahead and push here is just in case we have a nice big front end impact. I'm going to go ahead and put a nice bead of glue right on the top, getting that nacelle glued firmly to the top surface of the wing. At this point, our wing and our nacelles and our motors are done. We're ready to move on to our fuselage. The fuselage is the portion that's going to hold your tail assembly and your wing together to make the plane fly right. We have our main fuselage piece, we have our two doublers, and then we have our battery tray slash shelf. Eventually this front nose is going to get removed, but we're going to build the plane just like version 1 up to a certain point. So let's go ahead and get started and remove the cavities where we need. Once again, we're only going to go down to the paper. We're just kind of running this blade along just to give us enough room. You're going to notice one thing that I did on this design is I actually made these lines right here just a little bit narrower and let it pop out on these sides here. That's so the paper can go over the edges and give it a little bit more strength. And just like before, we'll fold it over 180 degrees and roll it out. The cleaner that you can roll this out, the better everything's going to fit together. Let's go ahead and do the same piece to this. We'll just go ahead and go right down to the paper.
90 degrees. Fold it over 180 degrees. Just roll it out. All right, so if you notice here, I got the cavities cleared out where my fuselage is gonna to fold together. I have the open spaces where the paper's gonna wrap around the foam. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this piece on so I have something to actually pull my nose. And I'm also gonna go ahead and remove this piece of paper right here. And my battery tray has the two cavities released as well. So let's go ahead and start dry fitting everything together. Now our battery tray is gonna be an A-fold, and an A-fold is where the side plates are above the bottom or the top plate. So just think A above and B beside. That orientation is always gonna to communicate to the side plates and how they lie with the bottom or the top plate. So to do a proper A-fold, we're gonna leave the side plate firmly against the table, and we're gonna rotate the bottom plate up against the table and press firmly down. Once we're happy with that fit, I'm gonna take my hot glue gun. I'm gonna favor most of the glue, starting about a quarter inch in and ending a quarter inch. I'm simply gonna leave the side plate down, rotate up 90 degrees, do the exact same process on the other side, and let it dry. Always make sure you give yourself at least 45 seconds to let your glue joint dry. If it doesn't seem nice and firm and rigid, give it a little bit longer. So one thing I really like about the Sparrow is it does teach you every technique you need to build over 50 of our designs. And on average, we add about one design a month, and that's not counting our amazing community who's continually putting out beautiful designs and free plans as well. One of the key techniques that you use is an A-fold. I'm just going to take a time to show you again here. This is our bottom plate, and if you notice that the side plates are above the bottom plate. In a moment, we're going to go ahead and do our B-fold on our fuselage, and we can look at the difference. So just to make life a little bit easier here, we have a couple etch marks here that are in our plans, but also on our speedboat kit. And what we're going to want to do is glue these doublers. These doublers are going to do two things. They're going to give us more rigidity and more strength in the nose, so if we have a front end impact, but it's also going to help guide our battery tray. Once we're happy with the placement, we're simply going to put a little bit of glue on. We don't have to put a ton. We're going to line it up with the, uh, the etch marks. A little wiggle back and forth. And we're going to hold it firmly for about 45 seconds. Exact same process on the other side. So we got our doublers on. Our next step is to do two fold overs. And that's another technique that will be used on many of our different designs. And that's just this right here. We already did that on our spar. I'm just going to put a little bit of glue on the top here. And I'm going to favor most of my glue away from this doubler here because I don't want these two to accidentally glue together. We took a lot from the uh, original Sparrow and we noticed that after a lot of impacts that sometimes the barbecue screws got a little weak. So this is just a little more strength and once again a little bit more bracing for that battery tray. Same process on the other side. A little bit of glue. Still got a little bit of wiggle it around a little bit nice and flat on the top. So our next step we're going to be kind of folding this together to make our B-fold. So with the A-fold the side plates were above the bottom plate. With the B-fold the side plates are going to be beside the bottom plate. So that means we're going to keep the bottom plate firmly against the table this time and we're going to rotate the side plate 90 degrees so it sits next to the bottom plate just like you see here. So anytime that you're working with something, especially like the fuselage, that's gonna hold the wing and hold the stabilizer, you want things to be as perpendicular and as square as possible. Now, if you don't have it already, this is a very simple square that you can get. And if you need hot glue guns, glue sticks, knives, everything, you know, rulers, we actually also have a crafty kit, which includes everything you need to build any of our airplanes. So we're gonna go ahead and hold this, and we're gonna do a dry fit. We always wanna make sure that we hold it at a 90 degree angle like this. The more that you take time to make sure this is square, the better your plane's going to look and the better it's going to fly. So let's go ahead and glue our first one. We're going to start just from this back plate here. We're going to fold up 90 degrees. And we're going to hold it nice and square. What side of the coffee mug gets the handle? The outside. All right, our 45 seconds is done. We're gonna go around the other side, and with the B-fold, we're gonna focus that glue on the side of the bottom plate. We wanna put the glue where it's gonna give us the most strength. Once again, back up again for 45 seconds. Our next step is gonna be gluing this back portion here. So let's go ahead and just do a quick test fit. 
make sure we kind of have the motion down that we want to do to get this glued together. Anytime we can use the table as our friend, we're going to do so just so we avoid burning our fingers and we get a much tighter fit. So with this opened up like a door, we're going to put a bead of glue on both sides, favoring towards the foam. Just squirting out maybe about an eighth inch stream of glue. I'm going to tip that over. I'm going to fold that down. And now pushing in and down, I'm going to get a nice tight joint there. I'm not bending it back and forth. I'm simply pressing down and pressing in against the foam. Why did the superhero flush the toilet? Because it was his duty. So we're now going to put our attention towards the front nose here. And for this, we're actually going to mold the foam here. And the more time you take and the more patience you take to mold this right, the better the fit's going to look. So right now you can see that I'm just kind of using my fingers and I'm rolling this up so that when I hold it with one finger, everything is nice and tight on both sides. We're going to go ahead and go up to this point right here. We're going to open this up. We're going to put a bead of glue right across the top here. And then we're only going to put a bead of glue to the point where it goes up to the first edge. Now we're simply going to hold this over and let it dry. We can also use a table as our friend and kind of rock it back and forth like you see here. Now this is a more advanced technique that you'll see on some of our uh, Warbirds and some of our more advanced builds. But if you can learn how to mold foam, it's amazing the fit and the finish that you can get and also how beautiful it'll look. My next step is we're going to slowly mold that back again to this back edge that you see. Same process as before, the better that you form it to where the foam's not having to work too hard to get that shape, the better off you are. Now these doublers on the top are going to make it press down just a little bit more than normal, but it's also going to make it much, much stronger. We're going to focus our glue on the top of the doublers and also on the paper. What we don't want to do is we don't want to glue these two halves together on the back though. So I'm going to go right down the doubler, put a nice bead of glue there, stop about a quarter inch. That just gives the glue a little room to spread out. Now I'm going to use a table as my friend, flip it upside down. And you notice I'm kind of like dragging it away, keeping it nice and tight. I always keep a scraper handy because I always get glue on my tables. By the way, if you're building on a dining room table, don't do this. Lay down a piece of plywood or a piece of glass over it, or better yet, get a workbench. There we go. In two simple steps, we have a beautiful piece of foreign foam and a very strong nose. Our next step is to cut off our nose. Now you're going to notice both on the plans and on the kits that there's a couple cut throughs through this. That's to help us line up. All we need to do is take it from the top seam, little rocking motion, to the next one. You can use a ruler if you want. And we're just going to work our way around. So once we cut all the seams, you're going to see that your nose separates nice and easy just like you see here. We're going to go and put that to the side and we're going to test fit our battery tray. Now you'll see on the battery tray that we have these notches. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of pinch these notches a little bit so the battery tray slides in a little bit easier. This will now slide in right to the point where the notch goes. You're also going to notice it's going to be flush with the back. Before we go any further, let's just do a quick test fit. This is going to be tight the first couple times. I'm just going to roll this in a little bit, make it a little bit easier for it to find its way. We don't want it to be so tight that it doesn't move. But what we do want is to be able to meet the back. All right, once you're happy with the fit, I'm going to go ahead and place a little bit of glue on this side and on this side and then down in the tabs. As I push the piece in, the glue is going to spread out going towards the back. So I'm going to favor a little bit towards the front. A little drop here, a little drop there. 
doesn't take a lot. And the same process as before. Slide it in. There we go. Once we're happy with this, we'll do one final test fit just to make sure it slides back and forth. If it's a little excessively tight, we can always go back and rub it on the table like you see here. Oops. There we go. Our last step on the nose is to peel back our paper. And what I like to do is just to fold it over. We'll drop a glue and then just tuck it in. At this point we're gonna go ahead and put our fuselage to the side and we're gonna put our attention towards the tail assembly. So for the tail assembly we're only gonna need these three pieces that you see here. We're going to have our score cuts facing up towards us, and we're going to line these two up as you see here. Grab a piece of tape here, and grab a thick tape. Easiest way to do this is to tape one half first, hold it open, line this up right to the tip, and then press it down. We can flip this over if we want now and cut off the excess. All right, now we have this hinge that you see here. We're gonna go ahead and take this and we're gonna cut our double bevel. We don't need to do this double bevel very sharp, just about a 40 degree angle. What we're looking for is to be able to take this gauge that you see here, and we don't want this fighting it too much. We just want to be able to hold this gauge up and let it dry. Once we're happy with that, we'll put a bead of glue right on the top. And this is not a perfect 90 degree angle. We're gonna hold this for about 45 seconds. So what did the hat say to the scarf? You hang around and I'll go ahead. We're gonna go ahead and flip this over 180 degrees and we're gonna cut a single bevel on the elevator side. And you're gonna see as I'm going in here, Whenever you're cutting a bevel for a hinge line, you want to make sure that there's no resistance going either direction. If you feel a lot of resistance going down, most likely you didn't cut your bevel close enough to the paper and it's causing it to bind. We'll do that on the other side. This one's a little bit easier. I'm going to go ahead and take our little angle gauge here, and I'm going to reinforce these hinges. To do a hot glue reinforced hinge, I'm going to take the tip of my hot glue gun, I'm going to press it right against the paper and put a very thin ribbon of glue. But I'm not going to leave it there. I'm going to scrape it all off now. What I'm doing is I'm pushing that hot glue right into the paper and the foam, so it's reinforcing that hinge. So even after many crashes and many flights, it'll still be really strong. The one thing you don't want to do is bend that back before it's thoroughly dried. Once the glue is dried, you can make sure you have full motion and do the other side. Just keep in mind you're almost going to take off the same amount of glue that you put on. Almost like a paintbrush. Now that we have our tail assembly done and our fuselage assembly done, we're going to go ahead and join the two. For this step, we're going to cut a single bevel on both sides coming on the inside of the fuselage. This is going to allow the elevator to sit down nice and flush and get a good strong glue joint. 
got a 40 degree bevel. You can see it kind of just make a little sign motion here whenever I have to work forward with that. Same thing on the other side. If it's a little wavy, you don't have to worry. No one's going to see that. And as always, we're going to test fit. And you'll notice there's two little hash marks on both sides of the elevator. We want to get those hash marks just on each side of the fuselage. You're going to notice this little point right here. We don't want to jam this too far forward or else our wing's not going to have enough room to mount. We want this little point to be right at the very edge, just so it's flush. Once we're happy with the fit, I'm going to place a nice bead of glue on both sides. Set this right down to center it up as close as possible. Look for our little gauge. Get it into position. Right there. And hold it for about 45 seconds. What did one ocean say to the other? Nothing. It just waved. As long as the fuselage is built nice and square and you lined up the marks between the fuselage, it should dry nice and straight. So for our next step, we're going to get the fuselage ready for the push rods and control horns. To do this, we're going to go ahead and take our razor blade. And we're going to pass it through here. You should see a little tiny hole. And we're just going to walk it through the score cut. Just like there. We're going to do that on both sides. This is going to be the portion where our, our push rod passes through. And we don't want it to bind. So if we take our push rod and we drag it through so it gets nice and loose, Just like that. We can now take our push rod, and it's plenty long here. I'm just going to remove the nose for some uh, ease here. Now take our push rod, and we can line it up with the back by the control horn. Our next step is to take our control horn, slide it over, and then press it into the little half inch slot where it's going to ultimately be glued. Now before we glue this down, we want to make sure that we get our servo placement right. We're going to take the servos that we previously centered, and if you haven't centered them yet, please go ahead and do so, because if it's not centered now, it's going to be much more difficult as time goes on. Now one thing we did do differently is we have stickers on both sides of the servos compared to the original version. We want to remove the side that's going to get the glue because we don't want to stick the sticker to the uh, plane. We want to stick the servo to the plane. Nice technique is also take your razor blade or a piece of sandpaper and just put some scratches in the plastic so the glue has a little bit more to hold on to. Once we have the servo scuffed and ready to mount, we're going to line this up about a quarter inch to a half inch back and we're going to push the push rod out with the control surfaces neutral to the hole that we want. Now I'm going to want to fly kind of aggressive with this so I'm going to go to that middle hole but if you're a beginner you want to fly really smooth, go to the innermost hole. I'm going to make a mark with my thumb. I'm going to hold on to this with my thumb, I'm going to lift this up, I'm going to go ahead and bend this wire straight down 90 degrees. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab the wire about 2 millimeters down, I'm going to bend that up 90 degrees. This is going to make what I call a modified Z-bend. Now we can cut this, got it. And now we can go back and we can bend this 90 degrees like you see here. And there's your typical Z-Bend. Now I wanted to show you this technique with a simple pair of pliers because many people have that. But if you don't want to have to make that complicated bend, you can buy something called Z-Bend pliers. Where it's as simple as going in, squeezing, and getting your Z-Bend. If you're going to do a lot of scratch building, this is worth every bit the 20 bucks it costs. It'll last you a lifetime. Now that we have one control surface done, we'll line up the middle hole and rock it through. At this point, before we glue our servo down, we're going to go ahead and glue our control horn down. A little bit of glue on the back. Press it in. So what we should see here is that the hinge line is straight above the hole. This is going to give us equal deflection in both directions. Make sure that you let this thoroughly dry because if this glue joint is weak, it could fail in flight, which means you won't have control of the airplane. Now, the nice thing about this is we can glue the servo wherever we need. As long as the servo is still centered, we can glue the servo wherever we need to make sure it stays centered. 
The only thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the push rod wire is at least a quarter inch below the wing uh, saddle so it doesn't hit the wing. Once we're happy with the placement, we drop a glue. I'm going to go ahead and move that back and forth, kind of pressing it in, get it right where I want to. There we go. And then we're going to hold this down for a good minute to make sure it's thoroughly dry. So for the next step, we're going to do the exact same process. We're going to go ahead and pass our push rod through, make sure there's no binding on it. We're going to hook this on and then temporarily set it in place. Just to show you how easy this one is, just grab it and bend it. Same process as before, we'll remove our sticker. Get some scratching, you can use sandpaper. Just something to kind of make it abrasive. Twist. And then if we knock that little control horn off like I did, we'll start again from the back. Happy, yeah. A little drop of glue. Anytime you're working with control surfaces, check and double check to make sure everything with the glue joint is nice and solid. Another 45 seconds. What do you call two guys hanging around a window? curtain rod. All right. So we're going to lift up our servo here, making sure that it's still nice and centered. Nice drop of glue right on the middle. Dropping it down about a quarter inch below and making sure everything looks nice and neutral. And another 45 seconds. All right, so for this step, we're going to use the pieces that are included in our kit. It's going to be two rubber bands and one of the two barbecue skewers. First thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to establish a hole going through our elevator and we're going to hold it nice and horizontal as we pass through one side and then we're going to turn it around and we're going to pass through the other side. You're going to notice that there's already a hole established inside the uh, fuselage that we use as a guide. Now this time before we go through the second side we're going to go ahead and loop our two rubber bands in there. Once we're happy with that, we can take our side cuts and cut them off. Same process as the front. We're only going to go through one side at a time. Pass it on through. And we're going to leave ourselves about a half an inch on each side. To get a nice clean cut, you can kind of crush down, rotate, crush down, rotate, crush down. Just like you see here, a little wiggle, breaks off nice and clean. I'm going to kind of move these rubber bands out to the outside. I'm going to grab my wing and I'll just kind of take my little wire so you don't drape them down in there. Just because we want to give a good test fit. We want to make sure everything looks good before we move on to putting our electronics into the receiver. One side forward. And that looks wonderful. Quick test fit on the nose. We're ready to put on a receiver. Let's go ahead and remove our nose. And for right now, we'll remove our wings. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to show you on the Spectrum Radio how to program your radio here to get the proper movement on your tail, but also how to get the proper motion and movement on your motors. Now we're going to have an additional video if you want to program for differential thrust that you can go to on our FT Tech channel to be able to go step by step through that process as well. Alright, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to press down. We're going to go to System Setup. We're going to say yes, we're okay with the RF turning off. We're going to go down to Aircraft Type. We're going to select for Wing Elevon. And the reason we're going to be doing this is because we're going to be using our main aileron channel to control this because it's a three channel. We don't want to set our tail to, uh, to V-tail. We want to make sure the wing is at an Elevon. Once we have it selected to Elevon, we're going to hit back once. Back one more time. Let it reboot. And then let's go ahead and go right into our channels and we're going to dial on a mix. We're going to go to mixing. And we're going to go to P mix. And we're going to go throttle to flap. Flap is also known as aux one. What that's going to do is when I move my throttle, it's going to move both the throttle and aux one proportionally. That way we can put one connection into each receiver and we don't have to use a Y harness, but also we can program differential thrust for the future. So once we select throttle, and then flap, we're going to go 100, 100. We also want to make sure we go down to where it says switch and make sure it's turned on. At this point, when we move this, we should see full deflection from our flap channel and full deflection from our throttle channel. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and make our connections with our receiver. We'll go ahead and hit back. So our next step is that we're going to power or plug in the power for our receiver. That's going to come off the power distribution board, straight in here. Now we're going to take one ESC, and we're going to plug that in the throttle. Our signal wire is going to be on the top. And we're going to take our second ESC, and we're going to plug that into aux one. Now make sure that your signal wires are all on the same side. In this case, it's going to be on the top. You're going to notice that our power wire doesn't have a signal wire because it's simply providing the voltage in the ground. So if everything's bound right, we should be able to go ahead and plug this in. <laughs> it's a little right, loud right now because it doesn't have the props on. But that's exactly what we want. Now that we're happy with the movement and everything, I'm just going to go ahead and take a little drop of glue put on the back of the power distribution board and glue it into the top surface of the wing. If you're not using your accessory for right now, you can tuck that in and just get it out of your way. I'm just going to put a little piece of Velcro on the receiver and on the wing. So that way we can just tap this in. And that way if we need to make our connections for our servos, we can unplug it, we can work it, stick it back in and it's ready to go. So our next step is to make our connections with our elevons. We can do that while the wing is still off. This is actually considered a V-tail, but the reason I'm calling it elevons right now is because we're going to be plugging this into the aileron and the elevator channel. Signal line matched up with signal line. Sometimes these connectors here can be a little bit tight. There's a little bevel on there, and if it doesn't fit loose, or it doesn't go in and it's too tight, you can always shave that bevel just a little bit more to give yourself the uh, ability to plug it in easier. There we go. Alright, so now that we have this all connected here, we're going to go ahead and power this up. What we should see now is when we pull back on the stick, the elevators go up. When we push forward, the elevators go down, and when we push to the right, both elevators should move to the right. And this is going to always be from the orientation as if you're sitting in the cockpit. That works great. So this current setup right now for full deflection is set up for high rates. We can now go into our dual rates and we can actually set it for low rates by flipping this around and adjusting our dual rates so it meets up with the edge. This is going to give us much smoother flying. So for dual rates, we're just going to press the roller ball once. We're going to scroll to dual rates. We'll go to aileron. 
And for low rates, I'll go ahead and dial down to about 70%. That's going to make our throw smaller. And about 30% expo. We'll do the same process on the elevator. Seventy percent, thirty percent expo. If our V-tail moved the wrong direction and we couldn't use reversing to get it to go the right direction, all we simply need to do is swap these two connectors that you see right here. At this point, we're going to go ahead and unplug it. I'm going to put the wing on and install our props. So one thing I like about the, the new version of the Sparrow here is you can actually fly this using the battery tray simply as a shelf to hold your FPV gear. You don't even need to put the nose on it. And also, if you have FPV gear here, you can install Velcro on the bottom for your battery down here to keep your CG proper. Now for this, I just want to have some fun. So I'm going to go ahead and take some Velcro that's included with our kit. I like to say fuzzy fuselage. I'm going to apply it right about here. So our favorite battery for this that balances out really nice yet keeps it light is this 450 3 cell here. This is made by Hyperion. We have links down below for that. This is going to give you about a five minute flight time. But you can put larger batteries in as long as you keep the CG proper. Just one last check to make sure that the uh, motors are going the direction I want. Okay, cool. Alright, so let's go ahead and plug this and install our props. So for proper orientation of the prop, you're always going to want to make sure that the numbers are pointing in the direction it's going to be flying. That goes whether it's a pusher or a tractor. You're going to notice that these have the skinnier holes. So we're going to make sure that we line up these skinnier holes. And that we turn it to line up the holes. And most importantly, that we screw it in. Just like on the other motors. Just leave them slightly loose until you get both of them threaded nice and clean. And the other side goes the opposite direction. These things kind of turn it until you feel it kind of engage the hole. And just make them snug. Now for proper balance, if you're using this battery here, this 453 cell, it's going to be roughly right about here. But you may notice if you had more weight on your tail or more weight in a different spot that you may have to move that. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on. I'm going to slide my nose on. So we're going to move the battery back and forth until we get our center of gravity proper just ahead of where you see the spar right here between the spar and the seam. So there's no real landing gear on this, but we do have a tail fin that we held off putting on until the very end, just so we don't damage it. That's going to fasten in the back that you see right here. So put that on. Simply apply a little bit of glue. Press it in place. We'll smear this off. And we're going to hold this down for a good 45 seconds to a minute because we want that extra strength. Time for one final dad joke. What do you call a blind dinosaur? Do you think he saw us? All right. At this point, this is ready for a maiden here. Uh, one thing we really want to encourage you guys, whether you're building a chuck lighter or whether you're building a full RC FPV micro machine, we want you to have fun. Even more fun than the crazy dad jokes. And speaking of those, leave your favorite dad joke down in the comments below. That way I don't have to look on the internet so hard. All right, let's go ahead and put this for a maiden. All right. So we are ready to fly. Anytime that you're going to be flying, especially if you're beginning the hobby, wait for a nice calm day and a big open space. If you've never flown before, check out our video, Six Quick Tips for a Successful First Flight. It's going to give you everything you need to know, kind of reinforce some of the things we did back in the build area, but also tips on launching into the wind, proper throwing, things like that. Maybe you don't want to pick a day to fly as windy as this though, but we're going to do it anyway. All right, let's see what happens. <laughs> Oh, it flies beautiful. Got a click of trim. 
<laughs> One thing I really love about this compared to the original version is as a pusher, it flew nice, but it was really difficult to balance and it was very difficult to get the battery in. This gives us the ability of having a lighter airframe all along. We do sacrifice just a touch of speed if we're flying on three cell, but we have a great glide ratio and it's very stable. There we go. <laughs> Friends, I want to thank you for being part of the Flight Test family. This can be built with simply one sheet of foam and a couple hours of spare time. I truly hope you take the opportunity to either get the speed build kit or download the free plans and make a memory. We'll see you next time.